Hi, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us for the very first GI Film Festival San Diego Virtual Showcase. We really hope that you enjoyed uh, this evening's films, and uh, we're going to do a discussion panel here in just a second. My name is Holly Schaffner, and I've been with the GI Film Festival Advisory Committee since its inception in 2015, so with, for five years. And I'm also a, a Coast Guard retiree. I am very happy to be the moderator for tonight's panel. And so let me uh, introduce our panelists. I'm gonna start first with the Rifleman's Violin. So we have Sam Ball. Sam Ball is the film director of Rifleman's Violin. Hi, Sam. We also have film producer Abraham Sofair. Hi, Abraham. We have film subject Stuart Kanan. Hi, Stuart. Hi, Holly. And then representing the film Rescuemen, the story of the Pea Island Lifesavers, we have co-author of The Fire on the Beach, David Wright. Hi, David. Hi. So big welcome to all of you and to Stuart and Abraham. I want to thank you for your service. Abraham served the United States Air Force and Stuart served the United States Army. So thank you for your service, gentlemen. Thank you. For all of our guests that are viewing tonight, I want to remind you that you can submit a question for our panel through our online form. It's just below your video window on your virtual screening room page. All right, so let's get this started. Sam, uh, let's, let's start with you first. We're going to start with the uh, Rifleman's Violin, and we're going to ask Sam Ball the, the very first question. So Sam, tell us a little bit about how do you heard about Stuart and his amazing story. Well, first, Holly, thank you for your service and for everything you do for KPBS. It's a great station and a great showcase here with the GI Film Festival, so we're delighted to be a part of it. Um, I heard about Stuart. Well, first of all, let me say I saw Stuart in a great film by Robert Altman um, several years ago called Shortcuts. Stuart plays himself. I live in San Francisco, and Stuart was the concert master, first violinist for the San Francisco Symphony for many years. He's had an illustrious career playing for people like John Williams as concert master. So he's um, got quite a, a film um, resume. And uh, I heard about the story in The Rifleman's Violin from my friend Abraham Sofair, producer of the film. Abraham's a fellow and scholar in residence at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University after an illustrious career in the State Department. And uh, Abraham told me the story. And as a filmmaker, when you hear a story like this, you pounce. Um, the company I work for and founded in 2002, Citizen Film, is uh, really devoted to filmmaking and storytelling that gets people thinking about our nation's history, about history in general, about the choices we make as individuals to shape that history and move the world towards democracy. And um, this story is a magical one in many ways. And uh, Abe had a, a brilliant idea, which I was pleased and excited to walk through that door that Abe opened, which was to have a short film that told the story, followed by a concert where Stuart would reprise the uh, concert he gave for Stalin, Churchill, and Truman at Truman's request 75 years ago now. And so we designed a program where we play a short film, Stuart steps from behind the screen for you film buffs in a Purple Rose of Cairo moment. He performs the concert he played in 1945. Mm -hmm. And then um, Abe and I put together a panel of historians with Secretary Schultz, who's also at the Hoover Institution, introducing the program where with Stuart, who was the only one of us to experience the Potsdam Conference, we dug into history a little bit. And that's a, uh, a performance we premiered at Stanford University's Bing Hall, and then showed, uh, I think, four or five times this multimedia performance at, uh, with slides in the background at Lincoln Center, at Walter Reed Theater, and a number of other places. So uh, the film you just saw was part of a, conceived as part of a larger multimedia experience and a living archive that's at the Hoover Institution. Um, and part of what we aimed to do was to um, come up with an innovative way to present an archive. So the Stuart Kanan Archives is part of the Hoover Institution Library and Archives. And if you go to potsdamrevisited.org, 
You can dig into history a little bit, see a concert Stuart performed, and see some wonderful photos. Stuart's got a great eye, and he was one of the first Americans to take photographs of Berlin after uh, the Allies took Berlin from the Nazis. So uh, I encourage you to go to PotsdamRevisited.org to learn more. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you for uh, sharing that story with us. And uh, Stuart, the next question's for you. So just back in uh, August, we celebrated the 75th anniversary end of World War II. When you were in World War II, you were just 19 years old. And did you have any idea that you're gonna be part of history way back then um, when you played for the big three? Well, to say that I had no idea is just putting it mildly. I mean, it, it never occurred to me. I do know that Truman, who was, had just been appointed president of the United States because of Roosevelt's death, he, uh, Roosevelt died in April and Truman, was, this was July, he was coming to Berlin to view the troops and do what presidents do when they're not playing golf or, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> anyway, uh, he, he wanted some GI entertainment. And I, after spending a, a number of months as an infantryman, I was sent back to Paris to help form a GI entertainment company called the 6817 Soldier Show Company. And when I got back to Paris from Germany, I found people like Mickey Rooney, Joshua Logan, Bobby Green. They were all ensconced there, ready to do their thing. And came Ju and then and a pianist by the name of Eugene List, a very well-known American pianist who's left us now. Uh, we this was in, in uh, July of '45. My commanding officer said that Truman wanted some GI entertainment, and he specifically said GI entertainment. And you fit the bill, he said to me, you and Eugene. And he said, maybe we'll take Mickey with us, Mickey Rooney, because who knows, maybe Truman would like some of his uh, comedic skills, uh, maybe it would help him get through these times. We flew to Berlin, landed in Potsdam, and we were built shown to our tent across the street from the little White House that Truman was staying in. And we were, there were four uh, cots there, Gene, Mickey, Bobby Green, and myself. We were just sleeping there. And our commanding officer came across the street and said, it's time to go get shined up and everything shaved and whatnot and come across the street with you playing for the president. That's all we knew. We didn't know there were several other gentlemen who were going to be involved in that. We went across the street and went up the back stairs to the uh, big house and came upon a, a, there was a dining room with French doors. And we saw people eating in there. They finished eating, they came out and God, we recognized <laughs> Truman. <laughs> we knew his face, okay, all right. But then came Joseph Stalin. Now I'm not sure how many Americans have seen Joseph Stalin up close, but he had a giant walrus mustache and a big round face, and he was in a marshal's uniform, uh, khaki colored. And then Winston Churchill, uh, sort of in civilian clothes, but with a cigar about three feet long. And they, there was a sofa sitting on the back porch, and the three of them sat down. Truman sat in the middle as being the host of the first state dinner. And Stalin sat, sat on his left as befitting his political viewpoint and Churchill was on his right, fitting his uh, uh, viewpoint. Mm. And there was a little uh, uh, upright piano off in the corner and I had put my violin down under it. And when I went up to get it, to get the violin, a Russian aide to Stalin leaped across the room and just carefully watched me take the violin out of the case to be sure that's what it was that I was taking out of the case. So I took that to the case, we were okay, we got, them. then Truman said, gentlemen, play something. Well, oh, that, yeah. Yeah, that's really great, Stuart. So um, I have some other questions here, but it looks like um, that we have some questions from the audience. And uh, the very first question is, you know, that's a really great story about playing in, in, in front of those big three. 
have you ever used that story to one up other music, uh, musicians? Like where you're like, hey, have I got a story for you? Have you ever done that? <laughs> well, I've been concertmaster of many orchestras, you know, the, the guy in the front. So I, I, I don't think I ever said I played for the big three. They're not known as music critics, the big three. They have other jobs. So I probably did not, uh, I, I don't think I ever used that, but it's a nice question. When I go back to that profession, maybe I will. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And uh, there's another uh, question here for you as well. Um, regarding uh, Mickey Rooney, was that um, specifically found to be sketchy to perform in front of Stalin uh, yeah. For, for Mickey? Yeah. Or was it just his just, I think, between the tent and the house, our commanding officer said, I don't think that's going to work with Rooney doing his stuff, because Rooney is probably one of the funniest people in the world, and I'm not sure that many of you have had an opportunity to spend a whole day in a small tent with Mickey Rooney, because he just, he just kills you with his humor. So I think they made a decision at that moment just to have music, because Truman actually was a very, now I wouldn't say an accomplished pianist, but a very, very loving pianist uh, for the piano, you know, for the piano. And uh, he probably wouldn't have appreciated that, but he did want the music. So that's, that's what happened. And Mickey stayed in the tent for a few days. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Well, Stuart, I'm sure that we could chat with you all day long about your stories and, uh, and, and your uh, amazing uh, time over there. But I want to move on to Abraham as well, um, because, you know, his, uh, his story is important here. And Abraham, I just want to ask you, uh, what makes the uh, Rifleman's Violin such a captivating part of history? Well, it was Potsdam was a very important uh, event. Uh, the war had ended uh, several weeks earlier. And uh, the Allies had to decide what to do about Germany. And the, uh, certainly the British and the Americans were trying to figure out what to do about Stalin. Stalin essentially taking over Eastern Europe. Um, and uh, you know, the Hoover Institution isn't known for its uh, musicality. Uh, <laughs> not, but, but what we did was we figured out uh, to join the music with the, with the historical significance of that conference. And so we had um, a wonderful historian named Norman uh, uh, Neymark, uh, and then um, a political scientist, Scott Sagan, uh, on the panel. And Norman explained the, the role the Soviets were playing taking over Europe and how tense that was. And then uh, Scott explained how the atom bomb was uh, really the unspoken story of Potsdam. Uh, Truman came there knowing uh, that the atom bomb worked. And he had decided, and all his generals had decided to use it uh, in Japan. And uh, maybe not Eisenhower, but everybody else, and certainly. Um, and what Scott explained was how the, um, the Japanese emperor had really delayed uh, submitting to the uh, US uh, uh, essentially surrendering because he wanted to be assured of his job. Uh, he wanted to keep his job as emperor. And uh, uh, Scott had gone through all the letters and, and correspondence relating to that. So the overall program was a mixture that way of the, uh, the different levels uh, of significance uh, in the Potsdam Conference. And that's what, with Sam's help uh, and, and uh, Stuart's natural uh, just great performance. Uh, we were able to record it all and, and people can, and, and to this evening, I gather, uh, you've enjoyed it and I hope you have. Uh, we certainly uh, uh, enjoyed making it and uh, it was a unique uh, experience for me. Oh, that's really great. Thank you so much. And um, for all of our audience that's uh, listening and tuning in tonight, if uh, anybody wants to check out the uh, Stewart's Hoover Institution Multimedia Archive, again, Stewart was one of the first Americans to take photos of Berlin after Allied troops moved out the Nazis. You can go to www.potsdam, it's P-O-T-S-D-A-M, revisited.org and check it out there. So we only have a few more minutes, but I really want to move on to our um, 
the next film, the next film is The Rescue Men. And that one is near and dear to me being a Coast Guard member. And I have to say, David, I served 24 years and we'd always heard about the Pea Island story, but we never really knew all the ins and outs until I didn't know all the ins and outs until just now um, checking all this, uh, all the film out. So first of all, thank you for making this incredible film and telling some of the history of, of the uh, preemptive to the Coast Guard. So tell us a little bit about how Rescue Men came about. How did you find this story? Um, David Zobie and I were first year, well, thank you. Um, but David Zobie and I were first year graduate students and uh, in an MFA program, in a creative writing program. I was thinking I wanted to write fiction and Zobie was a poet. Um, but Zobie grown up, he's from uh, Tidewater and he spent a lot of time in the Outer Banks. And if you've ever been to the Outer Banks, the, um, the culture of, of the Coast Guard, but of the life-saving service, which was a forerunner of the Coast Guard is just there. Some of the stations are still there. Some of them have been, have, have been rehabilitated into restaurants and things like that. And so Zobie was uh, keenly aware of the life-saving service in the Coast Guard. And one day he was working out there during the summer before coming to grad school. Um, and he had, the way he tells the story, he lived in this trailer without AC and it was hot and he was just looking to get out of the heat. And so he stepped into the North Carolina Aquarium and saw the photograph that's on the cover of the, uh, the, the really only extant photograph of those crewmen. And so he recognized them as lifesavers, but you know, the fact that they were black was just stunning to him. Like he didn't know anything about that and he'd grown up there. Mm -hmm. um, and so he asked me if I knew anything about them. And I'm from Landlock, Texas. I knew nothing. I didn't even know where the Outer Banks was. And uh, we started poking around and we just, like you, there was a, there was a little bit that was out about the, the Newman rescue, but there was just not a whole lot more. And there were, the, the little bit that was there, it was just clear that there was this interesting and rich story. So it just kind of grew from there. I mean, that led to the book. And then Alan Smith read the book um, he's a Marine Corps veteran and he was fascinated by the Newman rescue. So he contacted us and, you know, we decided to try to make a, a, a film. Oh, that's great. And um, I have a question here from the audience. The question is, what were some of the struggles when finding sources and resources to use with rescue men? Did you have any so, looking for yeah. uh, resources? resources? No, it was, it, it turned, it, when we first started, Zobie and I, with, with Fire on the Beach, which leads to rescue men, we were told by, we contacted uh, the, the Coast Guard, the Coast Guard historian, and we also contacted some Outer Banks historians, and everybody would say, there's just not, it's a great story, there's just not a lot of history. Uh, there's not a lot of documents. On the one hand, they would say Outer Bankers are terrible record keepers, and they would also say, being African American history, just the record is body. And so we took that at face value. But as soon as we started pushing a little bit farther, we just started stumbling up upon things. There were photocopies of, of, a, of the station was burned down when Richard, F, like they, like we talk about in the film, the station was burned down. There were photocopies of some reports, and so at first we're reading these photocopies, and then you know, again, we we're. I'm a Zobie's a poet. I'm a fiction writer. We're not necessarily the sharpest knives in the drawer as concerns history, but it just occurred to us that this is a photocopy that comes from someplace, and so we started doing that sort of backtracking, um, and we got really lucky. You know, archivists and 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 librarians are the awesomest people in the world. Like we were at the National Archives. Um, where the initial documents were. And I remember asking the archivist, well, there must be more documents. And he's like, well, no, this is it. And then it occurred to him, the National Archives had been decentralized uh, 10 years before. And so these were some records that, ended, that stayed in DC, but many of them had been sent to Atlanta. So we went to Atlanta and not only did we find more records, we found the logs for all the stations. I remember opening one log at one time and it was the page was stick, you know, the station logs the page was sticking and as I opened up I could tell it was a bumblebee that was trapped in the pages but was stuck and desiccated sort of came undone as I pulled the pages apart it was just a ton of resources but nobody had really pursued it. Mm, wow that's a that's an interesting story so I think that uh, this story was uh, so spectacular and um, you know Richard Etheridge certainly was a hero in his time and uh, for those that are tuning in and part of the audience, they may not know that there was an actual Coast Guard ship that was named for Richard Etheridge. And uh, the class of ships that, um, that his name falls under are named for enlisted heroes. So, and he certainly was that. Yeah, they christened the cutter Richard Etheridge, and I think it was 2010. It's wonderful. 
Great. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time for our virtual panel here. Um, so we're going uh, to wrap it up here in just a second. Um, but I just wanted to thank so much all of our uh, guests for tuning in and again for all the panelists. So thank you so much for joining us this evening and being a part of the very first ever GI Film Festival Virtual Showcase. I, I really want to say a special thank you to all those involved in making the showcase possible, including my fellow wonderful advisory committee members, the staff working behind the scenes. There's a couple of folks that are behind uh, the scenes at KBBS right now, um, keeping all this rolling. The uh, Film Consortium, San Diego, and of course, all of our festival sponsors. We certainly couldn't do it without you. It's a, definitely a team effort. The California Arts Council, and of course, uh, Skatina Daniels Communications. They have done all the public relations for this festival, as they have done um, since the beginning of the at uh, the beginning of the GI Film Festival as well. In the email reminder you got for the screening, there was a link to our attendee survey. It just takes a few minutes of your time, and your feedback will help us make the 2021 GI Film Festival San Diego event even better. So please fill out that survey. The full festival and juried film competition takes place in May of next year. It's going to be May 18th through the 23rd, and we hope to see you there. Our virtual screening continues tonight at 7 p.m. with a film called No Greater Love. And then tomorrow at 5 p.m., there's two stories of World War II pilots who broke barriers in their service to America. So again, thank you so much. We hope that you'll join us for the remainder of the festival and have a great night.